You are listening to The Evidence Locker. Thank you for choosing our podcast. Our sponsors make it possible for us to keep bringing you new episodes. Please support them as they have some great deals just for you, our listeners. If you prefer to listen to ad-free content, simply find us on Patreon, where plans start from as little as $2 a month. 25% of these proceeds are donated to the Doe Network, working to bring closure to international cold cases. For more information, follow the link in the show notes. Today's episode is brought to you by Noom, helping people around the world enjoy healthier lives through better nutrition and exercise. You don't have to change it all in one day. Small steps make big progress. Sign up for your trial today at noom.com forward slash evidence locker. Our cases deal with true crimes and real people. Some parts are graphic in nature and listener discretion is advised. Each episode is produced with the utmost respect to the victims, their families, and loved ones. The beautiful picturesque hilltop village of Potenza in southern Italy was established in the 4th century as a Roman settlement. With its narrow cobblestone streets and charming architecture, it is every bit a picture postcard Italian town. When police received multiple strange reports in 1992, they didn't quite know what to make of it. One woman after another told the same story of someone cutting locks of hair while they were using public transport. Most of the women did not notice it immediately, only later. A local man was suspected of these odd crimes, but Italian police didn't feel they had enough proof to arrest him. Then, ten years later, and more than 1,000 miles away, the same weird incidences were being reported in Bournemouth, England. Like their Italian counterparts, English police began receiving reports from women about their hair being cut while they were on trains and buses. But then a woman's body was found in Bournemouth, holding a lock of another woman's hair in her hand. Many years later, British police learned there had been a similar case in Italy. Both English and Italian police homed in on the same killer, an awkward man with a very strange fetish. In the spring of 2002, Dorset police began receiving reports of someone cutting locks off women's hair on buses and trains in and around Bournemouth. These bizarre incidences seemed to target women at random, the only common denominator being that they were all female and it always happened on public transport. Altogether, Bournemouth police received reports from 15 women and girls who had had their hair cut. One woman identified the man who had cut her hair but police didn't feel they had enough evidence to prosecute him, and he was not charged at this time. Heather Barnett was a hard-working single mother who worked from home as a seamstress. She cared for her 14-year-old son Terry and 11-year-old daughter Caitlin. Sadly, on November 12, 2002, a gruesome tragedy took place inside their home. When Heather's children arrived home from school in the afternoon, they discovered their mother's mutilated body on the bathroom floor. In shock and horror, they ran outside screaming for help. A neighbor who lived across the street heard the commotion and took Terry and Caitlin to her home, where together with her live-in boyfriend, she comforted them and let them use their phone to call the police. Police arrived moments later and found no signs of forced entry at the scene of the crime. Heather's blood-soaked body was lying on the bathroom floor. The attack took place on one side of the house, where she received multiple blows to the head, inflicted with a hammer. She was then dragged to the other side of the house where her body was mutilated. Her throat had been cut from ear to ear, and her breasts had been sliced off and left on the floor beside her head. A breast placed next to each ear. Her pants had also been pulled down. Police found a lock of Heather's hair was cut off and placed in her left hand. Curiously, a lock of someone else's hair was placed in her right hand. Heather's time of death was established to be shortly after she dropped her children off at school that morning. This would have given the killer the maximum amount of time before the children returned home from school. And he took his time killing her, mutilating her body, and posing it. Crime scene investigators found a clear footprint in Heather's blood next to her body. 
they were able to link the sneaker print to a specific type of Nike trainer, sized between 9.5 and 10.5. Due to the size of the footprints and manner of the mutilation of the body, police suspected the killer was a man. Police found a green hand towel with Heather's blood on it inside her home. Heather's children claimed that the towel did not belong to their home. Was this left on purpose, or was the killer just careless? Except for this potentially damning piece of evidence, there weren't many clues. The murder was planned with a chilling level of detail and precision. Police believed the suspect lived in close proximity to Heather because no one noticed any strangers around the area that morning. It seemed as if the killer knew Heather's routine for the timing of the attack. A neighbor, a friend, or even relative, perhaps. Investigators also theorized that the murderer brought a change of clothing with him, including a change of shoes, so that he wouldn't leave the apartment covered in blood and raise suspicion. Chillingly, this was the second murder in an otherwise safe neighborhood in four months. On the 12th of July, a Korean student by the name of Jong Ok Shin, known as Oki, was stabbed as she was walking home after a night out. The attack took place two blocks away from Heather's residence. Oki was taken to the local hospital, where she later succumbed to her injuries. Before she passed away, Oki told the doctor that she was attacked by a man wearing a black mask. Six weeks later, police arrested a local heroin addict, Omar Nagut, and he was sentenced to life in prison for Oki's murder. Because Nagut was already incarcerated at the time of Heather's murder, police did not believe the cases were linked. It was considered a tragic coincidence that both women had stab wounds on their bodies, made with a long, thin knife blade. We'll take a quick break for a word from our sponsors, Noom. If I have to be honest with you, whenever I used to think about dieting, I became instantly discouraged. But since I've been using Noom's psychology-based approach to change my eating habits, I'm actually enjoying the structure it has brought to my life. Noom is a habit-changing solution that helps you learn to develop a new relationship with food using personalized courses. Ever wonder why you feel like a donut when you're down? Or why you feel compelled to clear everything off your plate, even long after you feel full? Noom uses psychology to help you understand your behaviors and gives practical advice on changing the ones that don't serve you well. I love food, and thanks to Noom, I can still enjoy eating hearty meals without beating myself up about it. The focus is on nourishing, not restricting oneself. Whenever I get stuck for ideas, I scroll through the recipes on the Noom app, it's a treasure trove of scrumptious recipes like spiced Moroccan chicken soup or Old World goulash, grilled buffalo chicken quesadillas, and many more. With Noom, taking care of my health is empowering instead of stress-inducing, and I really appreciate that. And because I have improved my eating habits, I sleep better. So I have more energy, and as a result, am more productive during my workday. So what do you have to lose? Join me and millions of others around the world who want to get into better shape for good. Sign up for your trial and get psychology-based support to lose the weight for good at noom.com forward slash evidence locker. That's N-O-O-M dot com slash evidence locker. Now, let's return to today's episode. Shortly after Heather Barnett's murder, police interviewed all of her neighbors, including a man by the name of Danilo Restivo. They had heard his name before. A female commuter had accused him of cutting a piece of her hair on public transport. And this piqued their interest, because of the locks of hair placed in Heather's hands. Italian-born Restivo arrived in Bournemouth, England, in May of 2002. At the time, Bournemouth was said to be the happiest place in all of Great Britain to live. Restivo took odd jobs and made enough money to get by. He rented a room from an older woman who he met online, and soon the pair became romantically involved. His new lodging was across the road from Heather Barnett's home, and it was Restivo's landlady who was the first to react after Heather's children discovered her body. No other neighbors had seen or heard anything unusual on the day of the murder, however. Restivo admitted to knowing Heather and having been inside her home as she was making some curtains for him. Police would later discover emails on Heather's laptop from Heather to her sister, in which she commented on the client she was having difficulties with. The client allegedly wanted custom curtains made, but didn't really know what he wanted and kept changing his mind. In the email, Heather also noted that after the visit from said client, her spare set of home keys had gone missing, and she had suspected he had taken them. The client Heather was referring to in her email was none other than her neighbor, Danilo Restivo. 
As a client, Restivo freely admitted that he had been inside Heather's home, but his reason for visiting was strange. He rented a room in his lover's house. Why would he want custom curtains made? Was this just an excuse to get close to Heather? Heather's children flagged the issue of the missing house keys with police. This could have explained the fact that there were no signs of forced entry at the scene. Could Restivo have taken the keys when he visited Heather to discuss the curtains she was making for him, as she had suspected? When asked about the missing keys, Restivo denied any knowledge of it and was quick to offer an alibi for his whereabouts at the time of the murder. In fact, he still had the bus ticket for that day as proof. At the time of the murder, Restivo was attending a training seminar in information technology. He generally left home around 9 a.m. as the course started at 9.30. Heather was murdered between 9.30 and 10.30. Police investigated the venue where the training took place and found that all attendees had to sign in on a register. Restivo had signed in that day and noted the time. But the time seemed to have been altered, like he had initially written down a different number, perhaps the actual time, and then later changed it to 9 a.m. A digital forensics expert also made an evidential capture of the computer he claimed to be working on at the training center the morning of Heather's murder, and found that there was no user activity between 9.08 and 10.10 a.m. This combined evidence immediately cast doubt on Restivo's alibi. The police were also conscious that the bus ticket could have been obtained by Restivo that morning as he had said, and that he could have climbed off at the next stop and walked a short distance back to Heather's house. Police viewed CCTV footage and identified Heather driving back home at 9.30 a.m. after dropping her kids off at school. And around 10.15 a.m., a man is seen running down the road towards the bus stop with his hoodie pulled up over his head. Due to the quality of the image, police can't say for sure if the man in the CCTV is Danilo Restivo or not. The timing, however, does tie into a theory. Did Restivo wait for Heather to come home at 9.30 a.m., kill her, pose her body, attempt to clean the crime scene, and then run to the bus at 10.15 a.m.? He then arrived at his training, wrote down his name and the actual time in the roster, then realized he had to change the time and backdate it to 9 a.m. to ensure an alibi. During a police interview at Restivo's home, a detective asked to see Restivo's shoes and found that his Nike shoes were soaking in a bucket of bleach in the bathtub. When questioned about it, Restivo's behavior became suspicious as he could not provide a rational explanation other than he was cleaning his shoes, and so police seized the sneakers for forensic analysis. The bloody footprints in Heather's home were tested against the prints from Restivo's Nikes, but they did not match. But police were highly suspicious of Restivo, and he was placed firmly on their radar as a probable suspect in Heather's murder. They decided to look into his background in Italy, and found out that he was suspected of cutting women's hair on public transport there too, as far back is 1992. Potenza woman Angela Campocciaro reported that she had a 10 centimeter strand of her hair cut without consent. Eventually, another 12 women came forward to report similar incidences, all of which took place on public transport. Rumors of a man cutting women's hair on trains and buses quickly spread. However, few believed this bizarre claim and thought that it was an urban legend. Flowing hair is traditionally a symbol of beauty. There was, however, a certain deep, dark, and sinister undertone to the hair cutting. Someone was stalking their next hair cutting prey. Someone was taking something from a woman without their permission. Someone was presumably taking the woman's hair to their home, smelling it, and caressing it. It was as if having a lock of hair somehow linked the attacker to his female victims. A strange fetish indeed. Although Restivo was widely believed to have been the person responsible for the unsolicited haircutting, he never admitted to it and was never charged. However, it was later revealed that Restivo kept a diary, which became known as the Diary of Horrors. This wasn't your typical diary, but rather a record of Restivo recounting the incidents of women catching his attention, and he then cataloged their hair. He was a predator, a stalker who stepped over the line taking an intimate keepsake from his victims. So who was Danilo Restivo? And why were people so quick to believe that he was the creepy public transport hair cutter? Danilo Restivo was born on the 3rd of April in 1972 in Sicily, Italy. At the age of 10, he moved with his family to Potenza, Italy, where he grew up with his father, mother, and sister. 
The Restivo family were well-known and highly respected within the community. They had many important friends and religious connections in their new hometown. The Restivos were close personal friends with the parish priest of the local church, the Church of the Most Holy Trinity. The priest even attended Danilo's 18th birthday party. In stark contrast to the rest of his family, Danilo had always been a social outcast. He would mostly play by himself and was often picked on by other children. Even in early adulthood, he didn't really have any friends and exhibited disturbing behavior. Danilo was a lonely boy who displayed worrying signs of sadistic personality from a young age. When he was only 14, he tied up two younger boys in the courtyard outside the library where his father worked and tortured them by inflicting small cuts with a knife. The issue was resolved between the parents and the police were never informed. At the age of 20, he was accused of harassing young girls in the neighborhood, but nothing was ever done to stop him. Friends and neighbors generally felt that he was a weird kid and avoided him if they could. When Restivo signed up for his national military service, doctors performed a routine medical and psychological examination. They found that he exhibited a strange attitude towards sexual behavior, and because of that, he was prohibited from enlisting. In Restivo's diary, he wrote about his difficulty in forming relationships and his internal conflicts in connecting with women and younger girls. The Restivo family, however, seemed reluctant to seek help for him. They were determined to protect their proud family reputation. To address his strange behaviors, they opted to hide him from the world, rather than asking for professional help. So the troubled boy grew into a man who acted awkwardly in social situations and had great difficulty relating to women. In 1995, when Danilo was 23, he became the prime suspect in the disappearance of Eliza Claps, then age 16, from outside of the Church of the Most Holy Trinity in Potenza. Eliza Claps was the youngest of three children to her father, a local tobacconist, and her mother, who worked as a clerk. She grew up in a happy Catholic family with strong religious values and dreamed of becoming a doctor one day. She was warm-hearted and very sweet. Your classic good girl, whose daily routine and life revolved around church. She sang in the choir and was much loved by her peers at school. She was young, innocent, and naive. Quick to trust people. On a beautiful autumn Sunday, the 12th of September, 1993, Eliza had planned to join her family for lunch at the Claps family country house. On her way there, she had agreed to quickly meet 23-year-old Danilo Restivo outside her church, just after the 11.30 a.m. mass. Restivo and Elisa weren't really friends, but they knew each other. Restivo liked Elisa, and she was too nice to say no when he wanted to meet. She knew that he really didn't have any friends and felt bad for him, so she took pity on him. What she didn't realize was that Restivo had become infatuated with her. He had asked her out many times before, and she always said no. Still, things remained polite between them. But Restivo decided it was time to change tactics, and told her that he no longer liked her romantically, and only wanted to be friends. In fact, he confessed that he was interested in one of her friends and wanted to talk about it. Elisa was somewhat relieved, and agreed to meet Restivo outside of the safest place she knew, her church. She was happy to help him with his pursuit of her friend's affection. He had also told her that he had bought her a present for passing her recent exams. Sadly, after this meeting, Eliza would never be seen alive again. Eliza's brother knew about her plans, so when she didn't arrive for lunch that afternoon, he went to the Church of the Holy Trinity where Eliza was supposed to have met Restivo to look for her. But the door to the upper levels of the church was locked. The only person with the key was the priest, Don Mimi Sabia, a friend of the Restivo family who had left town for a few days to attend a retreat. Eliza's brother approached Restivo, who didn't really have a straight answer as to Eliza's whereabouts. He claimed to have seen Elisa leave the church, but they remained there to pray. Restivo shrugged off Elisa's disappearance and speculated that something must have happened to her on her way home. Elisa's family reported her disappearance to local police, who were not concerned. She was a teenager and the thinking was that teenagers do silly things, like run away from home. When Elisa's brother tried to contact Restivo again, Mr. and Mrs. Restivo told him that Danilo was no longer in Potenza, and that he had left to go back to university. When there was still no sign of Elisa after a few days, the police grew concerned and finally decided to look into the case. She was last seen entering the church where she had agreed to meet Restivo. 
but she was never seen leaving the church and never returned home. Police questioned Danilo Restivo, who claimed that after leaving the church, he had an accident. He fell while crossing a building site on the side of the road on his way home. According to Restivo, he cut his hand on some scrap metal and sought medical attention for his injury. Police were suspicious, and Restivo didn't suffer any other injuries from his fall. They contacted the doctor who treated him. The doctor's report suggested that Restivo's injury looked like a cut from a knife. While Restivo was being interviewed, police officers visited the Restivo family home and asked Restivo's father for the clothes Danilo was wearing on the evening he met Eliza. He gave them clean clothes, but police noticed washing hanging on the line outside. The officer asked about the clothes on the washing line, but the family refused to hand these over as police did not have a search warrant. This threw a shadow of suspicion over the family, who from the beginning appeared to be hiding something. The Church of the Holy Trinity was searched three times by police, but the searches were always conducted per Restivo's version of events. The police only searched the locations where Restivo said he had been with Eliza inside the church. It was an old, large church complex with many rooms, and investigators neglected to search the entire property. As time went by, the police investigation focused more and more on Danilo Restivo, and all evidence collected pointed in his direction. Police continued to question him, but didn't have any solid evidence that he was involved in Eliza's disappearance. He insisted that he was innocent and did not yield to circumstantial evidence or police theories presented to him. Three years after Eliza went missing, however, Restivo was convicted for lying to a judge about his movements on the day of her disappearance. He was sentenced to 20 months in prison, and no further legal action was taken against him. As his sentence was less than two years, it was automatically converted to a suspended sentence and Restivo remained a free man. It was widely believed that Restivo was responsible for Elisa's disappearance and that he had murdered her and hidden her body. But without the body, it was near impossible to build a case. The case would remain unsolved for 17 years. Restivo eventually left Potenza and traveled around Europe for years before settling in England to start a new life. In England, Restivo became romantically involved with his landlady, who was much older than him. This suited him well, seeing as he tended to avoid contact with women closer in age to him. They were far too intimidating for the socially awkward Restivo. Instead, he found comfort being around older women, where he used his childlike charm to win them over. Seven years after Eliza's disappearance, and with British police aware of Restivo's alleged hair fetish, which linked him to Heather's murder, they still didn't feel like they had enough evidence to charge him with the murder. Investigators were also aware of Restivo being the subject of ongoing inquiry into Elisa Clapp's disappearance in Italy. British police opened a line of communication with Italian police. Devon law enforcement placed Restivo under surveillance, around the clock. They followed him to a park where many women went to walk their dogs. He was filmed watching women walk by, hidden behind bushes, crouching in dense vegetation, and also following them, all without their knowledge. Police found his behavior highly suspicious. On a warm day where the police watching him had to even keep their window open for some cool air, he was wearing clothing suitable for a much colder day. With a thick sweater and the zipper pulled right up and gloves, as if to be covering as much as possible to protect potential forensic evidence from escaping. All of a sudden, as if something had spooked him, he stopped, stood up, and started walking to his car while taking off his gloves. The undercover officers broke cover and took Restivo back to his car, which they then searched. Inside the car, they found a backpack, and inside the backpack was a murder kit of sorts, a six-inch filleting knife, two pairs of scissors, gloves, wipes, and tissues, and a black balaclava. Police seized the backpack and let him go while they investigated further. Police still didn't believe they had enough evidence to arrest Restivo, but he remained their prime suspect for a total of eight years. During this time, despite still being under police surveillance, further reports of hair-cutting incidents were still being made to police. A woman who witnessed a man cutting a woman's hair on a bus in 2004 later identified Restivo as the man who did it. But he wasn't charged. After the murder of Heather Barnett, Forensics had investigated the DNA of strands of hair found in Heather's right hand. To assist with the investigation, 
all women who had had their hair cut while on public transportation were invited to come forward on an English TV program in the hopes of linking Heather's murder to the haircutting perpetrator. Many women came forward, but police were unable to link the hair cutter with Heather's murder. Forensics didn't find any DNA or fingerprints at the crime scene. They did, however, find dark fibers on Heather's body and around the apartment. It is thought that these fibers came from gloves, which the killer had worn while inside the house. In November 2006, police arrested and questioned Restivo, and he confirmed again that he was inside Heather's home days before the murder as Heather was making him a set of curtains. However, he denied having any involvement in Heather's murder. He was also denied being the one responsible for cutting strangers' hair on buses and trains. Restivo was eventually released. After Heather Barnett's murder, a green towel containing the victim's blood was also found at the murder scene. Heather's children confirmed that the green towel didn't belong to them, and so police presumed it must have belonged to the killer. Perhaps the murderer brought it to clean the crime scene. Fast forward a few years, and due to breakthroughs in forensic technology, scientists using a new technique were able to extract Restivo's DNA from the towel. When confronted with the new evidence, Restivo used the excuse that he had taken a towel over to Heather's house as a color match for the curtains he had commissioned, but police did not believe him. A new forensic technique was also used to re-examine his Nike sneakers, which were found in a bucket of bleach in his bathtub. A chemical was sprayed onto the inner soles and immediately came up as purple, indicating that Restivo had placed his blood-soaked feet into the shoes. It seemed as though Restivo was knowledgeable in forensic capabilities of the time, but could not foresee future developments in technology, which eventually assisted police in building their case against him. Back in Italy, Nearly 20 years after Eliza Claps' disappearance on the 17th of March, 2010, police finally had a breakthrough in her case. Builders working on the roof of the Church of the Holy Trinity Church found human remains in the roof of the attic, a mummified body covered by tiles and other debris. The young female body had been mutilated. Her pants were pulled down, and she was clasping hair in one of her hands. The body was Eliza Claps. The discovery was a definitive turning point in the cases of both Elisa Claps and Heather Barnett. Italian police contacted the British police with the details and the development of the disappearance and confirmed Elisa's murder. British police received special permission to use the new forensic evidence gathered from the green towel from Heather Barnett's crime scene and Restivo's Nike sneakers. They were also permitted to include further evidence gathered from the Italian investigation after the discovery of Elisa Claps's body. With the details of both murders being so similar, English police finally arrested Restivo for the murder of Heather Barnett. Italian police also then charged him with the murder of Eliza Claps. The unique similarities surrounding the details of the two murders helped link the killer to both murders. The women's bras had both been cut off. Their bodies had been mutilated by a knife or blade. Their pants had been pulled down. And both had locks of someone else's hair placed in their hands. Eliza's clothes were cut in an almost ritualistic manner and with great precision. Police believed he used a pair of scissors. Could these have been the same scissors he used to cut women's hair on buses and trains all those years ago in Potenza? Elisa was probably killed by scissors or another sharp object. Restivo's DNA was also later found on her sweater. Even after her body was found and British police presented him with the overwhelming evidence linking the two murders, Restivo continued to maintain his innocence. He stood trial for Heather Barnett's murder in the town of Winchester, England, in May 2010. During the trial in England, Restivo finally admitted to having a hair fetish. He faced the jury and admitted that he was a weirdo, confirming that he got gratification from cutting women's hair. He was found guilty of the murder of Heather Barnett and sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 40 years. Meanwhile, Italian prosecutors had also begun the process of bringing Restivo to justice for the murder of Elisa Claps. The Italian judge pronounced Restivo guilty of the murder and sentenced him to 30 years in prison. The verdict has been appealed and is still awaiting the final verdict from the Italian Court of Appeal. After this appeal is decided, there will be no more avenues for Restivo to take to escape his judgment in Italy. Combining both English and Italian prison sentences, Restivo will spend the remainder of his life in prison. Having first been sentenced in England, the English judge said, 
you are not to come out of prison again. You are a recidivist, a vicious, cold, and calculating murderer who killed Heather in the same way as you killed Eliza Claps. You deserve to be in prison for life. After the trial, Heather's brother Ben Barnett stated, Restivo would have spoken to the children because they knew him as a neighbor. He is a callous and calculating person. He left Heather for her children to find and made sure he was the person who tried to comfort them. I will never understand that. Restivo has already had eight years of freedom that my sister never had. I've thought about the death penalty, but I think it's too good for him. It seems like the easy way out. I think he's going to have a miserable rest of his life in prison. It was thought that Restivo made advances on Eliza on the day he met her outside of the church and that she did not reciprocate his affections. His inability to tolerate rejection led to frustration, which then led to Elisa's death. If he was rejected, he felt as though he didn't deserve to exist, and he'd rather put an end to Elisa's life to protect himself from the hurt of the rejection. It was believed that Restivo had a homicidal urge linked to being rejected by women. Did Heather Barnett also reject his advances? Revisiting Zhang Ok, Oki Shin's murder, it is hard to ignore similarities to Elisa and Heather's murders. All three women were small, had dark hair, and were attacked from behind. A lock of someone else's hair was found on the ground next to a bloodstain at Oki's murder scene. The weapon used in Oki's murder fits the pathologist's description of the murder weapon used to kill Heather, which fits the description of the six-inch knife found in Restivo's car. Police also found a black balaclava among Restivo's belongings. Could this be the black mask, which Oki referred to in her dying statement to the doctor treating her in the hospital? Bizarrely, Eliza, Heather, and Oki were all murdered on the 12th day of the month. The day that police followed Restivo into a park and broke cover and found a murder kit in his car was also the 12th of the month. Was this just a coincidence? Omar Naguid, the person convicted of Oki's murder, although facing possible parole if he admits to the crime, has always maintained his innocence and has stated that he'd rather die in jail than confess to a murder he didn't commit. Does this push the spotlight back onto Danilo being Oki's murderer? Many believe so. A recent documentary entitled Unsolved, The Man with No Alibi examines new evidence which could give Omar an alibi which he needs to prove his innocence. Prosecutors never charged Restivo with Oki's murder because it was more opportunistic than the others. Aliza's and Heather's murders were planned. But was Oki perhaps Restivo's second victim? And was he interrupted before he could complete his planned murder? Neighbors heard Oki scream. Could this have frightened Restivo off? And if he is responsible for Oki's murder, are there more victims that we don't know about? But why did it take nearly 20 years to solve Elisa's case and bring Restivo to justice? Had her body been found sooner at the last place she was seen alive, Heather, and possibly Oki, could still be alive. Some feel policing mistakes were made, while others claim that the parish priest of the Church of the Holy Trinity, Don Mimi, has much to answer for. Why wasn't there a thorough search done the entire church? This was, after all, the place where Eliza was last seen before she disappeared. And why did police initially suspect a voluntary disappearance? They thought that Eliza had merely run away from home. Why wasn't it taken more seriously? Eliza Claps's mother places much blame on the parish priest for denying her access to search the church herself and only allowing police in areas where Restivo had said they had been. Police requested full access to the church from the priest, but Don Mimi obstructed the investigation and twice denied police entry into the rest of the church, and they did not press the matter any further. Don Mimi was very friendly with the Restivo family and can be seen in photographs at Danilo Restivo's 18th birthday party. His church, where Elisa was last seen, was also the only church in Potenza not to ring their bells for Elisa on the 10-year anniversary of her disappearance. Don Mimi, who has since passed away, has taken any possible knowledge of what happened on the day of Elisa's murder with him to the grave. The question remains, why was the door to the upper floor in the church locked when Elisa's brother went looking for her? And is it a coincidence that the priest left town after she came up missing? Was he either directly or indirectly responsible for allowing Elisa's killer to go free to kill again? This we'll never know. What is clear is that Eliza entered the church on that fateful day, but never left. 
The final question to be asked is, are there any other murders that we just haven't yet linked to Danilo Restivo? Restivo will never again be a free man and still claims his innocence to this day. But two courts in two different countries say otherwise. Sadly, no matter how severe the punishment, nothing will bring back 16-year-old Eliza, who had her whole life ahead of her, nor will it bring back Heather to her children. An awkward man with a strange fetish thought he could get away with murder. But in the end, his salacious urges made him come undone. We'd like to thank today's sponsors, Noom. Sign up for your trial today at noom.com forward slash evidence locker. That is Noom, N-O-O-M dot com forward slash evidence locker. If you'd like to read more about this case, have a look at the resources used for this episode in the show notes. Also visit us on social media to see more about today's case. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also check out our channel on YouTube. If you like what we do here at Evidence Locker, subscribe in Apple Podcast or wherever you are listening right now and kindly leave a five-star review. This was The Evidence Locker. Thank you for listening. Okay, then.